In Ghana, an uncontrolled haphazard small-scale artisanal mining exploration continues to poison major rivers and streams and reduce forests at a faster rate. Through the U.S. Foreign Press Center, we explore how mining is done in the USA, specifically the state of Arizona. At the Tucson airport, we join Bruce Gordon, pilot and founder of EcoFlight, an organization that is using aerial perspective in educating and advocating for environmental conservation and justice. EcoFlight, which is the organization, which is a non-profit organization, we work with over 400 conservation groups around the country, mostly in the West now. In fact, last year we flew a thousand people. So to pin it down to just one issue is very difficult because you know one of our primary missions is to address climate change. We fly over Tucson and the breathtaking copper mining fields of Phoenix, Arizona. You know, these, these basically, they're, since they're on the flat, there's a dam all the way around it. And uh, the construction on most of these dams is, the, is, the, is, is called upstream construction. So they basically start and they use the tailings themselves to build the dam. And, and the way they keep their integrity is, is you can't have water right up to the edge of the, the, the uh, dam itself. Roger Featherstone is our guide. An aerial view shows an imposing complex of organized mining fields, settlements, tailings dams and natural environments traveling miles. More organized compared to this footage of small-scale mining in the Apamprama Forest Reserve in the Ashanti region of Ghana. There are 27 major mines in Arizona, including 10 major copper mines, which produce 23 to 632 million pounds of copper per year. Only two of the 10 major copper mines are located north of Phoenix. The rest are located in the southeastern part of the state. Mining in Arizona happens either on public or private land. Though both attract environmental scrutiny from the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, mining on public land requires one to present a detailed environmental impact assessment as part of the permit process. Dinah Bear, a retired counsel for U.S. President's Council on Environmental Quality, identifies the shortfalls in Ghana's environmental impact assessment laws. I spent some time in the last couple of days looking at the environmental impact assessment in Ghana. There seemed to be three elements that were missing from the, from the process in Ghana that, um, that are really the key elements here. Number one is the requirement to look at alternatives. The second is the requirement to uh, analyze cumulative effects, not just direct and indirect effects. And the third, very, very important, is judicial review. Um, not just an administrative appeal, but judicial review by federal courts. The requirement to look at alternatives allows an agency and the public and other agencies to actually consider different ways of achieving a particular goal and to say no at times or to come up with a completely different approach to an issue. One of the alternatives that agencies always have to look at is the no action alternative, not going forward with the project. And that was used for one particular mine uh, where the Secretary of Interior personally made the decision to not go forward with the mine because of its impacts on indigenous peoples. At the offices of the Arizona State Natural Resources, we engaged Director of Water Quality Division, ADEC, Trevor Baguer, Deputy Director, Randall Matas, Director of Air Quality, Daniel Chekolinski, and Manager for Air Permits and Compliance. Our offer protection program is all about protecting our groundwater. All groundwater in Arizona is considered drinking water, so we protect it as if it's drinking water. The Clean Water Act program is all about making sure that if there are discharges, if there's water coming off of the mine site, 
that it meets certain standards, that it's treated and such that it's not impacting it, it's not negatively impacting our water body. And then our reuse program ensures that any water reuse that occurs on a site is done in a way that's still protective of both surface and groundwater. The aquifer protection program, the groundwater protection program, has what are called categorical facilities. If you are going to have certain types of mine features, you've got to come to get to us to get a permit before you can even construct those facilities. The Clean Water Act programs, it all depends on what you're going to do with the water. If there is a nearby stream, maybe not as big of a, a water body as where you're from, but if you're going to discharge to one of those regulated waters, you have to come to us to get a permit before you can discharge. So it's a, it's a pretty intense process um, with lots and lots of technical documentation um, and, and uh, uh, many engineers working on ensuring that whatever you would be doing um, is going to protect that groundwater. Um, at what point do we deny that permit? Um, there have been instances when we have denied permits in the past. Generally, when we deny permits, it's when the mining operation wants to continue with mining, but they fail to provide the technical justification to show that that mine will be operated safely. Most of the time, if a uh, company determines that they cannot meet the requirements, they will withdraw those permits and we do not have to deny them. So we're looking at, you know, background air quality. So what does that air quality look like? We will then get information from the mine on what the processes are, the emission controls, what their throughput, and, and you know, we will then model that, looking at that information along with weather, topography, um, and other factors to ensure that the emissions from the mine do not negatively impact the ambient air outside the mine before we would issue a permit. The mine would also go through a public comment period. So, you know, when we get that, we would then provide that permit out for the public so they can comment in our public hearing so we can hear from the community that they're going to be operating in. Make sure that we answer any concerns or the mine answers any concerns that the community may have. When, whenever the company does any kind of testing of the pollution, we are out there because there are very rigorous EPA prescribed protocols that companies have to follow. So we will have our stack testing person out there to supervise that kind of testing. Additionally, with respect to monitoring, in some of our kind of newer mining projects, we require ongoing air quality monitoring. So when we look at the air dispersion model that the computer spits out, we kind of know what the hotspot locations are. So meaning that based on the dominant wind direction and how the emission units are expected to perform, your impacts are going to be maybe at a maximum level at a specific location. So in that general area, we may require the company to place a monitor. But beneath these regulatory assurances and array of organized mining landscapes from above, communities have major current and future concerns. Velon Hussey is chairman of the Tohono Udam Nation, a federally recognized tribe of Native American people in Arizona and northern Mexican state of Sonora. The damage that it's caused already to local communities is contaminating the basic necessity of life, water. Water is life. And the effects that it had from the local communities in drinking that water years after years after years we can't undo the the diseases or the health challenges that it may have caused to individuals we can't undo we can't go back and turn the time for those but we can fix what's wrong right now and so we're working on that with the mine Roger Featherstone, former miner and director of the Arizona Mining Reform Coalition, a civil society group in Arizona, is worried about America's over 100 year old mining laws, which he believes have become ineffective in protecting the environment. Federal mining laws are 150 years old. So, so we see because of the outsized influence that the mining industry has on our agencies and the legislature, that the laws that protect the environment in our communities are weak. Um, first of all, on the federal side, the federal government feels because of the laws they have, they don't have the right to say no to a mine. And there's simply got to be some places in the United States that are off limits to mining from, from day one. Certainly the big one is there has to be some places that are off limits. 
Um, the second one is there's got to be uh, much better laws as far as protection, um, um, both while mining is continuing or happening, and 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 then for reclamation, and and when the mining life is over. This is Oak Flats, a beautiful piece of national forest land in central Arizona. It is considered a sacred land, especially to the Apache tribes. It is close to the town of Superior, where Henry Munoz, a former miner, was born and raised. This peaceful forest campground is about to be disturbed with a proposed resolution copper project jointly owned by Rio Tinto and BHP companies. Though the project promises little surface environmental impact with its 5,000 to 7,000 feet underground mining, Henry Munoz thinks otherwise. I talked to the CEO of Rio Tinto in England when I went with Roger Featherstone uh, and I confronted him with that question. I said, why don't you do the conventional mining that we did in the past where you didn't have subsidence, you uh, recycled the waste and you didn't consume that much, that much of water? in that mining technique. And he said, because we can't make any money, he said. So in other words, I told him, so you're basically telling me you have to destroy my environment and my drinking water so that two foreign mining companies can make money? I said, that ain't gonna happen. 250 billion gallons of water. That's enough water for a municipality of 160,000 people that they use in one year. For 40 years, that's how much water they're going to draw up. 40,000 acre feet, maybe more, a year for this mine project. So when I got on the council, we were uh, pushing for recreation, tourism, hiking, and climbing. As you can see, this area is so beautiful. And this area will last till the end of time. But once you bring in that mine here and you destroy all of this environment here, is it worth it? 40 years or eternity of beauty? Despite the regulatory agencies for mining in Arizona, the city's major environmental police are its residents. Civil society groups like the tribes, Carlos Apache and the Odono Nation Mining Reform Coalitions test the law to fight against abuse of the environment and the preservation of life. <laughs> 